Hello, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from Alloy Chemistry and welcome to this video on benzene mechanisms, dyes and colour. And this is for the colour by design topic or CD topic for OCRB salters. So this video is specifically designed for people who are studying OCRB salters and has actually been um, um, arranged around the specification. And in fact, this is one of three videos that make up the CD topic. Um, so it's not generic like you might find in other resources online. And um, this is actually tailored for the Salter specification. And in fact, I've done videos for year one and year two. So these are revision videos, the ones with the black backgrounds. Um, and they cover the full specification for Salters. Um, and they've also done some whiteboard tutorials as well where I walk through um, certain topics. So for example, if you want to know something about titrations, then I've done a whiteboard tutorial on titrations. So there's quite a comprehensive range of stuff there. It's all for free as well. All I ask is you hit the subscribe button. That'd be absolutely fantastic. Um, the um, As long as people keep uh, basically as long as people keep subscribing and watching them and and liking the videos then I'll keep making them and I'll update them when new specifications come around as well so there's a full range of stuff there and um, this uh, video as well is made up of revision slides that I've made um, and you're um, welcome to purchase them if you click on the link in the description box below you'll be able to get a hold of them there they're great for revision so you can use them on your tablet or your smartphone and move through them at your leisure I've known people to print these off as well and use them as revision notes so it's great for that just put it into your into your file alongside your other notes and in, in the in the separate topics so so like I say this is one of three videos on this topic so if there's nothing in here um, if it's the other aspects of the CD topic such as um, organic uh, there's like organic synthesis as well and retrosynthesis then we've done other videos on that as well so not everything for cd will be in here okay so like i say this is dedicated for the salters specification and so therefore it meets these specification points so in this video we're going to be looking at bonding and structure um so we're going to be looking at functional groups within azo dyes in particular and look at chromophores we're also going to be looking at organic functional groups as well um, such as benzenes and arenes linking in with color. Um, it's nice and colorful, this one. Um, we're then going to be looking at organic reactions, such as um, the organic reactions of benzene, such as sulfonation and friedel crafts alkylation and acylation reactions. Um, and we're going to be looking at a little bit of um, energy and matter as well. So it's a small element of that in there where we look at um, UV absorption in organic molecules. So the origins of color. And of course, the topic is all on color by design. So you're going to see a lot of color involved in this and dyes. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start off by looking at, because we're going to talk about dyes and color, dyes contain benzene in there and reactions of benzene and understanding of benzene is very important um, to, um, to understand um, if you're if you're in the industry of making colorful substances like dyes, for example. So we're going to start by looking at benzene. So benzene is a cyclic planar molecule that has the formula C6H6 and it makes up aromatic compounds. Okay, we're going to look at our dyes, for example. Uh, dyes contain benzene and aromatic compounds, so that's why it's important to understand this. So carbon has four valent electrons. These are the outer electrons, and each carbon is bonded to two other carbons and one hydrogen atom, as you can see in this diagram there. So you can see there's a carbon, which is the purple circle. Uh, that's going, that's bonded to a carbon here and a carbon here. And obviously we've got the hydrogen that's also bonded to that carbon too. So the final electron in the carbon is actually in a p orbital and that sticks above and below the planar benzene ring. So that accounts for all four valent electrons in the carbon atom. Okay, so the lone electrons in the p orbital, so that's these ones here, these combine to form a delocalized ring of electrons. So you can see there's your delocalized ring of electrons there, and that forms this classic donut shape you get with benzene. It's making us all hungry. Okay, so due to that delocalized electron structure, all of them carbon-carbon bonds in the molecule are actually the same. Okay, so... Um, and they have the same bond length, that's what we're saying. So the bond length is about 139 pic picometers. Um, so this gives it actually quite a unique property because it allows us, it gives the um, the benzene some stability and makes them a little bit, um, a, a little bit um, more stable than what you might expect. And we'll look at that later as well. So the carbon-carbon bond length in benzene is actually a little bit strange, a little bit peculiar, because it actually lies between 154 picometers, which is a single bond, and 134 picometers, which is a double bond. 
Okay, so it actually exists somewhere between the two. So it does have like quite a unique property. Okay, so benzene um, is normally drawn in the skeletal formula. So the diagrams that you'd see in there show the orbital shapes and it shows obviously how these orbitals can then blend together to form this delocalized structure. So the, the spare orbitals. So normally um, you will be seeing them drawn in the skeletal formula. Now there's two ways in which it can be drawn. Um, one way is the way which the um, which the exam board is going to be more likely to accept, and the other way is just showing you as a as a as a as another way of drawing it. There's just there's certain preferences here, but I'll go through it. So this first way is the um, um, is called Kekulé structure, and it was named after a fellow called August Kekulé, who basically came up with the structure. And he said that benzene had these double bonds that around the around the um, uh, within the within the benzene ring so you had these double bonds here and he said that they actually alternated so you had the double bonds there so this one would be there this one would be there and this one would be there so he said that these double bonds actually alternated around the uh, around the benzene ring and so he described it like this so you had three alternating double bonds okay but you may see it drawn like this um however we know and the, the the best way of drawing it and what the exam board would be looking for um or the safest one should i say um is actually drawing it using this diagram here so this shows the delocalized ring structure that we know benzene has much better so this shows the circle here shows the delocalized electrons within the benzene ring and so this is the one that really you should get into the habit of drawing but you may see it on literature elsewhere like online for example it might be drawn like that they just mean the same thing that's just Kekulé structure this is just showing you more accurately and actually in this video I will be using this structure because this is the one you are probably be more familiar with and really uh, really should be using as well okay so remember um, there is a hydrogen because this is a skeletal formula sometimes it's easy to miss certain atoms from it but there are hydrogens attached to each of these um, at each of these points here and um, these are not drawn in the skeletal formula we only drawn obviously the carbon points here but there are hydrogens coming off there that's going to become very very important when we look at um, mechanisms so benzene mechanisms and um, to do with say free crafts which we'll look at later nitration and sulfonation so you're going to see quite a bit of um, um, a quite a bit of work on mechanisms to do with benzene as well okay so we're now going to look at the um, stability of benzene remember we said that delocalized electron and the usual bond lengths to do with benzene and um, this has quite an impact on on the stability and hence the reactions that they actually undergo so benzene is actually more stable than the theoretical alternative um, cyclohexa 135 triene model so that's Kekulé's model where he said that these double bonds would alternate uh, around the benzene ring so actually we know that benzene doesn't have that um, you know that separate distinct double bonds it's this delocalized system with a bond length somewhere in between a single and a double bond so what we could do to kind of prove this stability this unusual and unique property of benzene is that we can measure the stability of benzene by comparing the enthalpy change of hydrogenation in benzene and in cyclohexa 135 triene so hydrogenation is just where we're adding a hydrogen to a double bond okay so we're going to measure the enthalpy change when we do that for both molecules so if we hydrogenate cyclohexene okay so we just take the cyclic compound and we have one double bond in there okay it has an enthalpy change of minus 120 kilojoules per mole so it's an exothermic reaction now cyclohexene only has one double bond as you can see here so the enthalpy change for this to this is minus 120 kilojoules per mole now you would expect if this um, if benzene actually did have three distinct double bonds, then you would actually have a, um, well, you'd have three times that because you have three separate double bonds. So if we hydrogenate all three, then it, we should be three times that. So in theory, we should have something in the region of minus 360 kilojoules per mole. And that would seem sensible. However, when we actually take benzene and we do hydrogenate benzene practically, then actually we get a an enthalpy change a total enthalpy change of minus 208 kilojoules per mole okay so this is the experimental value so we predicted something in the region of minus 360 kilojoules per mole 
But actually, when we did a practical in the experiment, we actually find that benzene has an enthalpy of hydrogenation of minus 208 kilojoules per mole. So that's a little bit strange. So what we can deduce from that um, is that actually benzene is a little bit more stable than we thought. And when we're looking at the mechanics of this, the energy is required to uh, the uh, energy is required to break the bonds, and energy is actually released to uh, form new bonds. Okay, so we're breaking these bonds here. Okay, and then we're forming new bonds because we're forming adding two hydrogens to this benzene ring here. So normally, if you had three separate bonds, that would be minus three hundred and sixty. But actually, um, the amount of energy released—that's the energy. Um, release to actually break uh, to actually form the bonds here is actually a lot lower and this suggests that the energy required to break the bonds in benzene um, uh, is, is actually higher we need a lot more energy to break these bonds in the in benzene practically than if it was in this structure here so this suggests that actually benzene like I say for this reason it suggests that benzene is a lot more stable than the theoretical cyclohexa 135 triene with the three distinct um, double bonds um, and the stability that's like we said before the stability that's attributed to benzene the reason why it has this stability is because of this delocalize this ability to delocalize its electrons right across that benzene ring so um, that gives us the you know so the, the the reason why it's more stable like I say is because um, the amount of energy required to break that um, um, to break the the ring structure is actually higher than what we would expect if we had three distinct double bonds so that's a bit interesting okay so um x-ray diffraction as well so it's another way later on obviously this was this is one method um of, of measuring the enthalpy change but using a bit more high-tech technology um x-ray diffraction also proves that all the carbon carbon bonds are the same length which completely goes against Kekulé's structure because Kekulé said you had distinct double and single bonds and clearly that isn't the case in x-ray um, diffraction which is just a, um, a method of looking at the structure of an atom so it's really quite powerful instrument and um, shows us actually all the bond lengths are um, the, well, the bond lengths are actually all the same so that definitely proves and you need to be able to explain this as well to the in, uh, to the examiners is proving why benzene is unique and why does it have this stability so there's a few there you've got you've got two there one is to do with bond enthalpy uh, and one is to do with x-ray diffraction okay so um what we can then do is we can then look at um, the reactions of benzene. So we know its properties. Now the reactions um, we're going to um, we're going to look at because you're going to need to know about um, various different reactions of benzene. Now normally what you would think is okay, it's got some kind of double bond system or this delocalized system. So you would probably expect that um, like alkenes, they probably react in a similar way to alkenes. Um, but actually um, that isn't the case. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the reactions of alkenes first. Um, so that's the, uh, reactions involving double bonds. And so to illustrate this, we're going to look at the addition of bromine um, onto a double bond. And these types of reactions are electrophilic addition reactions. So if you had a classic reaction where you had a double bond, we can add, um, say, for example, halogen or any type of molecule like that. In this case, we're going to look at uh, bromine and add that to your double bond. So adding bromine water to an alkene causes a color change and it goes from this brown orange to a colorless solution. So bromine is this browny orange color, that is the electrophile. So remember an electrophile is an electron loving species and this adds to the alkene and it forms dibromoalkane which is colorless, okay? So here we are, here's our molecule here. So we've got our alkene, in this case this is ethene and the Br2 is polarized as the electrons in the double bond repels the electrons in bromine. So you can see here, we've got a high electron density here in this, in this double bond. Now when this bromine molecule, if the bromine was on its own, there'd be an even distribution of electrons. So there'd be no polarity on this molecule. But when you think as this molecule approaches close to this electron density, the electrons in this molecule here are going to nudge over to one side because there's going to be a bit of repulsion. So it's a bit like bringing two magnets together. So um, so uh, two magnets together that repel each other as they get closer, you then start they start to push apart from each other. This is the same here. So you've got electrons here and the electrons nudge to one side and it leaves a delta positive bromine on this side, which actually then is, is open to 
uh, is open for attack. And this is exactly what happens. So the electron pair and the double bond is actually now attracted to the delta positive on the bromine, this induced dipole. And what happens, this actually breaks this bromine-bromine bond. So let's have a look at the mechanism. There it is. Okay, so we've got a lone pair um, of electrons. The electrons from the double bond is attracted to the delta positive bromine. So that attracts on there. Now that's starting to form a bond with the bromine. Now bromine can only form one bond. So this bond has to break. So the electrons from that bond then jump onto the bromine. And so what we're left with is an intermediate so we form a carbocation intermediate there. So there's the bromine that's added onto the carbon. The double bond no longer exists, and we have a positive charge on the carbon, as you can see there. Our remaining bromine, which is here, Br-, is now free to float around. However, the bromine has a lone pair of electrons because of this negative charge, and so this can then attack this carbocation because remember with uh, mechanisms the curly arrows always show the direction of electron transfer so this is going from the double bond to the bromine and this is going from the bromine to the carbocation so let's have a look there it is okay so that attacks that and then finally we form our colorless 1,2-dibromoethane is formed now that's the traditional way if you had a double bond that's how you would add a chemical to it okay it's electrophilic addition reactions however the reactions of arenes are different because of the properties that they have with this delocalized electron uh, delocalized electrons within the benzene ring this actually changes the um, the uh, uh, types of reactions that benzene can undergo so let's have a look at this Okay, so when arenes react, they actually undergo electrophilic substitution reactions, okay? They don't undergo addition reactions like you would like you would normally get with a double bond, like with alkenes, okay? So as we've seen, benzene has that high electron density in the middle. It has that delocalized of electrons, so this makes it attractive to electrophiles, okay? So these are electron loving substances okay that's fine because bromine was an electrophile because it was attracted um uh, it was attracted to that the lone pair well the the double bond the electrons there so there's no difference there but as we've seen benzene is really really stable okay so unlike your traditional alkenes that we've seen before they don't undergo electrophilic addition reactions okay so like the bromination of the alkene that we'd seen before this would disrupt that benzene ring of electrons if we did do an addition reaction. Um, and so therefore, we would actually have a, um, a situation where the benzene would be less stable than what it was before. And you know, if you've seen any other videos, you know that I always say that benzene, uh, sorry, benzene, uh, molecules and atoms and carbons and electrons are incredibly lazy and they want to be in the lowest energy state possible. So for benzene, for it to do a substitute, uh, to do an addition reaction, um, is just is just not going to happen because the product you form is just going to be less stable than what it was before. So why would it do that? Okay, so it's not going to do that very easily. So instead, they actually undergo a substitution reaction, and this preserves that benzene ring structure. So that's good. Um, and this is where actually a hydrogen or a functional group on the benzene ring is actually substituted for the electrophile that we're using to attack it. Okay, so we get a substitution reaction rather than addition. And there's four types of reactions that you need to know for salters. Lucky you. Um, so you've got Friedel-Crafts acylation. You've got Friedel-Crafts alkylation. We've got halog halogenation reactions. Um, and we've got nitration reactions as well. We're also going to look at um, sulfonation um, as, a, as another type. So actually there's kind of five, isn't there? So we're going to look at all of these different types of reactions. They're very similar, okay, in terms of how they react. So don't worry too much about this. Okay, in terms of do I need to remember all four of these? Well, yes, you do, but the actual mechanisms are really similar, so you're going to see that. So don't worry, don't panic too much. Okay, so we're going to look at. I've used this word before, which are arenes. So an arene, um, an arene is just a compound that contains a benzene ring. So you're going to get used to seeing that word arene, um, and they're named in two different ways. Okay, so here we can name it with benzene at the end. So, for example, bromobenzene. So that's your halo, um, or your your halo, uh, your halo um, uh, benzene compound. So we, that's one of the reactions we need to know. Your one-two dimethyl benzene. So this is your 
um, alkylation reactions, which we'll look at as well. Or you can have nitro benzene, which is nitration. So you've got bromo benzene, one, two, dimethyl benzene, and nitro benzene. You need to be able to name these molecules with the word benzene on the end. Okay. Here are the ones that are named as phenols. So these have the functional group C6H5. So for example, a phenol, um, which you will have seen um, probably in year one chemistry. So a phenol is a benzene ring with an OH group attached to it. So it's an alcohol. Um, and then you've also got phenyl amine, uh, phenyl amine, sorry. So this is where you've got an NH2 or an amine group attached to a benzene ring. So it's phenyl amine. So you can see there's, there's, there's two ways in which you can name um, arene compounds. So just make sure you're familiar with the way that they're named, whether it ends in benzene or whether it starts with um, phenyl, as you can see on there. Okay, so let's take a look and let's start and look at some of these reactions of benzene. There's quite a few here, so we're going to, we're going to go through them, but you'll see the similarities because there's that many of them. You'll see, all right, yeah, okay, I see how that works. So, um, so you'll see that that often that you'll you'll get an idea how that works. So, as seen before, benzene undergoes electrophilic substitution. Okay, that should say substitution, not substation. <laughs> I must have got electricity on the mind there. Um, so it undergoes electrophilic substitution. That'd be cool, wouldn't it? Electrophilic substation. Um, and these reactions, have, so they go undergo them types of um, reactions. And we need to know the conditions that these reactions undergo. So this is a, a generic uh, a generic version. So here you've got a benzene ring and we have an electrophile, as you can see on there. Okay, there it is. Okay, so this should be, this R group, sorry, should be an E, not an R. Get all that changed. I've got it all updated. If, you're, if you are going to get these or you are going to have access to these uh, by clicking the link, I'll get all this changed for you. Okay, so um, that should be an E. So obviously that adds on to the benzene. Now what happens? Notice a bit like the alkene reactions. It's the arrow comes from the high, the density, the, the area of electron density to high electron density, which is the ring. Them electrons move to the E+, plus. that's your electrophile, okay? You're then left with this funny intermediate stage here where you've got a positive charge in the middle and you have a state where the hydrogen was already on there already, that's why that's there. And obviously the electrophile then adds itself on there like that. You have this positive charge in the middle, but one of the key things you need to know when you're drawing this is um, the delocalized electron ring cannot extend, very important, must not extend beyond the adjacent carbons that's been attacked. So this is the carbon that's been attacked and here are the adjacent ones left and right. This delocalized structure cannot extend beyond that point or beyond that point. Okay, if it does then um, that's not correct. So just make sure you're drawing it really carefully. We have that positive charge because effectively we formed a new bond here. So some of the electrons here have been involved in forming the bond with the electrophile, okay? And so then what we find is we have this that's been formed again. That should be electrophile, that should be E on the top there. But the electrons from the carbon-hydrogen bond jump into this positive charge and reform that ring there, okay? And obviously the H plus is then formed um, as well on the side. So you can see this is a substitution reaction. So the hydrogen that was there is now got the electrophile that's now attached on the top there. Okay, so just make sure you're aware of that. Okay, so benzene rings are really stable molecules. Okay, as we said before, so reactions are really difficult. So what we need is something with clout. Okay, and we need a very, very strong electrophile to react with these. And thankfully, these can be created using something called a halogen carrier catalyst. Okay, so a halogen, you'll see how halogen carriers work later, but halogen carriers uh, are typically something that contains um, aluminium halides or there can be iron and iron halides. So a classic example of a halogen carrier is something like AlCl3, um, and you'll see how that works later when we look at some of the um, reactions or using the halogen carriers. But notice, just before we move on to the specific reactions, notice this electrophile here is an E+. plus. It has a plus charge on here, a positive charge, and it's that positive charge that you need for this benzene to be at all interested in reacting to form the product. Okay, so what we're now going to do is we're going to look at a type of reaction. We're going to look at Friedel-Crafts reactions. Now, benzene is really used um, mostly in the pharmaceuticals industries and dye stuffs, and we're going to look at the dye stuffs later. It's quite a, a big section in this video on dye stuffs. 
However, due to that stability of that benzene, it's really difficult to react. Okay, so Friedel Crafts reaction helped to solve this problem. Now you're probably thinking, what is Friedel Crafts? Well, Friedel Crafts is actually the names of the two people who came up with this reaction. And they are J uh, Charles Friedel and James Crafts. So they were French and American chemists, and they basically came up with these with the reactions or particular reactions involving benzene. So they, the ones that you need to know, are the reactions where an acyl group, such as RCO, or an alkyl group, which is R, is added to a benzene molecule. Okay, and after the acyl or alkyl group is added, the benzene structure is then weaker and it makes it easier to modify it further. Okay, so what these two chaps came up with is a reaction where we can add something to the benzene ring, well, substitute the hydrogen for the, um, the molecule that they're after. And then once you've effectively added a group onto the benzene ring, that now has weakened the structure slightly. So it makes it easier to add further groups onto that ring if required. Okay, so that's what they came up with. And that is really useful because we use that in the pharmaceuticals industry and we use it in dye stuffs. And you'll see the dye, uh, the dye stuffs um, uh, products later on in the video towards the end of the video. Okay, so in order to add on to the benzene ring, the electrophile must have a very strong positive charge, okay? So acyl groups have a positive charge, however, that isn't positive enough. So remember what I said, you need something with clout, you need an electrophile with a proper positive charge. None of this delta positive stuff because that just will not react with the benzene ring. You need something with, with a bit of clout. And like I say, we can use that halogen carrier as the catalyst, the ALCL3, as we said before, and that allows us to make this really powerful electrophile with a full positive charge. And that's what we need to just at least to break this benzene ring. And so in the Friedel Crafts acylation or alkylation reactions, we have to actually react an acyl chloride or an acid chloride or a halogenoalkane okay, with the halogen carrier, that's ALCL3, to create that strongly positive electrophile, okay. So, let's have a look and see what we can do with this. So, to make the powerful electrophile um, with either of them, then we need to use, like say, your halogen carrier, ALCL3, and we basically prep it using the reaction that we're going to see here. So, here we're going to use Friedel Crafts, this is uh, this part we're going to be looking at how the halogen carrier can be used to prepare the electrophile in Friedel Crafts acylation. So what we're going to be using here is an acid chloride or an acyl chloride and basically here's your um, acid chloride here and you've got your halogen carrier. Now the halogen carrier accepts electrons away from, um, accepts a pair of electrons away from the acyl group. So here's your acyl group here and so as a result the polarization increases and a carbocation is formed. So what happens is this is pulling electrons away from here, that chlorine breaks off that molecule, and then we end up with this carbocation here with our AlCl4- at the end there. And so a stronger electrophile is produced, there it is. So this did have a, this is pretty reactive. Um, it does have a delta positive here, but that delta positive is just not powerful enough to react with benzene on its own. So what we've done is we've literally made a proper positive charge here. Now this is reactive enough, this species here is now reactive enough to benzene. And we're gonna introduce this to benzene and see uh, what product we produce. Okay, so now we've made that electrophile we need to react that with benzene and we're um we're going to make a less stable phenyl ketone so this is less stable in comparison to the benzene molecule we started with but to do this reaction we need to do it under reflux okay because we're using volatile chemicals so we don't want any to escape and we use a dry ether solvent so let's have a look at the reaction so there's your benzene ring and there is our phenyl group um that we um uh, sorry our our um acyl group that we uh, formed before so it's a carbonyl group should i say let's get it right so it's a carbonyl group okay so you've got this delta positive um uh, uh delta positive we've got this proper positive i'm gonna be teeth and get me brain in gear here and um, so you've got this po proper positive carbon here this carbocation um that's sitting here now the electrons jump from the benzene ring towards that 
positive carbon atom, that carbon cation. That's a really powerful electrophile, so the electrons will move towards that there, and this effectively breaks this benzene ring to form this intermediate here. So you can see we've added that group on there now, and the hydrogen still remains there. Again, don't extend this loop um, further than the adjacent carbons to the carbon that's been attacked, which is the one in the middle there, okay? Right, so taking that intermediate, remember we formed that ALCL4- minus in the previous step, so that's now kind of floating around here now. So what's going to happen is that now actually gets involved. So the electrons in that bond then start to break away onto that hydrogen and it forms um, a bond or the chlorine then starts to form a bond with the hydrogen. Okay, And so then what we find is we produce this product okay so the electrons you can see the electrons in the ch bond jump into that positive as we've seen before that stabilizes that, that that ring and reforms the ring as you can see there the hydrogen that was there is now bonded with the chlorine to form hydrogen chloride and are because this is a catalyst the aluminium the alcl4 minus because it's lost the chlorine reforms alcl3 again so that's reformed and then that is then allowed to then react further um, because remember that is a catalyst so it can't be used up it must be reformed okay so i hope you've got the hang of that because what we're now going to do is we're going to look at Friedel-Crafts alkylation okay similar type of reaction we're just instead of adding um, an acyl group we're going to add an alkyl group instead okay so again, to make that powerful electrophile, we've got to use our halogen carrier, just as what we've seen with the acylation reaction. And so the mechanism for this, which you need to know, is down here. So your halogen carrier, your ALCL3, is here. And what happens is this accepts a pair of electrons away from the halogen or alkane. So this is the reaction that we need. So we need a halogen or alkane. And you see we've got a delta positive and delta negative on, obviously, on our halogen there. So what happens is the electrons move from that bond um, into the chlorine because this is effectively pulling electrons towards this side and if that forces the bond to break and then the chlorine then bonds with the aluminium which has got a delta positive in the middle um, that forms a bond there and so then what you're left with is an R plus there's your carbocation um, and we have ALCL4 minus as we'd seen before so it's just a slightly different um, slightly different um, mechanism to what you've seen before but the, the principle is the same using a halogen carrier to produce this stronger electrophile which we can then use to attack the benzene ring so this time we've just got an alkyl group that's your R plus okay so let's introduce it to the benzene ring so we've made the electrophile and so we need to react it with benzene to make a less stable alkyl benzene. Again, it's under reflux and dry ether solvent. So just the same as what we'd kind of seen before. So there's your benzene ring and there's your R+. This is your alkyl group. Same thing, electrons move from that double bond, from the double bond, from your delocalized electron to the R+, because that's powerful enough now. It breaks the benzene ring and we form this intermediate with a positive charge. Remember, the um, these can't extend beyond these carbons here. And it's a substitution reaction. So we have this intermediate that's formed there. Okay. Then this intermediate is then there. There's the intermediate. And we have our ALCL4- back again. Same mechanism look. So this forms onto the hydrogen. Okay. And then that CH bond breaks. There it is. And we form our product there, which has got an alkyl instead. Again, HCl is produced and your halogen carrier is then reformed. Exactly the same as acylation, except we're using an alkyl group, which is R+, instead of your acyl group, which has got your um, carbonyl group in there. Okay, So you can see how familiar it is. You don't, it's not as if you don't have to remember all separate, completely different reactions. They're very, very similar. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the halogenation of benzene. And so halogen carriers can also be used to help add a halogen onto benzene rings. So remember, um, we said that was one of the um, one of the four, well, there's actually five because you've got sulfonation as well, but um, I'll come on to that later. It's not really a, a full mechanism you need to know, but halogen halogenation was one of them. So really straightforward there's your halogen there okay so you've got cl2 it's got a delta positive and a delta negative because it's got an induced polarity because it's approaching um, something with the delocalized electrons 
we still have our halogen carrier there, AlCl3. And what this does is this polarizes um, this molecule, which is Cl2 um, and or Br2. And the positive part of the halogen acts as the electrophile. So this is the electrophile that's going to um, interact with this benzene ring. Now what's going to happen is this is then going to attack the um, the chlorine on that side and we're going to, and then that's going to break that bond. The electrons in that bond there then move on to here. So that forms your AlCl4- again. So remember that from last time. Um, this then forms your chlorine. There's your chlorine there and your hydrogen, which is there on this side. Okay. Again, we form our intermediate just like we've seen before. So there's no difference here apart from this bit here, but the halogen carrier is still pivotal in um, in creating that delta that you know that powerful electrophile okay so then what happens with this intermediate is the um the carbon hydrogen bond there's no external factor here but the electrons here jump into that um positive charge here and it reforms the ring again and what we're left with is a halogen attached to the benzene ring we form our um, AlCl3 and the H plus that was um, detached from the benzene ring that was originally on there now reacts with the lone chlorine that was on, uh, sorry, the chlorine that was on the AlCl4 minus and that forms HCl. So I've just color coded it there so you can see it. And AlCl3, you reform your catalyst back again. Okay. So really, really straightforward um, the same type of mechanism. So it's not too bad. Okay, and the other type of reaction was the nitration of benzene. Um, really useful, in particular for azor dyes, as you'll see later. Um, but nitrate in benzene is useful. Like I say, it allows us to make dyes for clothing, but it allows us to make explosives as well. So um, TNT was um, uh, is one of the products that's used. So tri nitro toluene. So that is um, the nitration of benzene um, is TNT. So that's how it makes explosives. Okay, so if we heat benzene with concentrated nitric acid, so that's HNO3, and sulfuric acid, which is H2SO4, we form nitrobenzene. However, like we've seen before, we have to make a powerful electrophile first. Okay, so we we do this in two steps almost, just like we'd seen before. We're going to make our electrophile first, and then we're going to introduce the electrophile to the benzene so we can react it. Okay, so the first step we have to do is to make the electrophile first, the powerful electrophile. So we do this in two steps. So the first step is to make the electrophile first. And we do that by reacting sulfuric acid with nitric acid. So there's your nitric acid there. There's your sulfuric acid. We wrap that together and we form these two substances here. Now, what's really interesting to note here is that they're both acids. However, your um, nitric acid here is actually acting as a as a um, as a base it's accepting a proton from sulfuric acid so we form h2no3 plus whereas your sulfuric acid is acting an acid because it's donating a proton to hno3 to form h2no3 h2no3 plus so just be aware because they might ask a question on that they might just kind of sneak that one in there um this was to do with um which you will have seen as well in in, in um in year two chemistry if you have if you've done the topic then you'll know what i'm coming from if you haven't um what you need to know is um about bronsted lowry acids and bases so a bronsted lowry acid is something that donates a proton a bronsted lowry base is something that accepts a proton so even though the words of both of these have acid at the end the nitric acid is actually acting as a base not an acid okay so that's just that that's the main criteria for an acid or a base is um is the movement of the proton whether it accepts or donates okay so now we form that what happens with that nitric bit the hno3 bit hno3 plus is this decomposes to form no2 plus and h2o and it's this this nitronium ion here that is your powerful electrophile that's going to react with the benzene now just before we move on um, and see how this then interacts with the benzene ring this hso4 minus just keep an eye on that obviously that's decomposed to form that which is going to be added onto the uh, onto the benzene um and then uh, this is going to be just floating around in water but just keep an eye on what we do with this you'll see this will come back later on in a bit in the next slide okay okay so we're going to take this nitronium ion no2 plus and we're now going to react this with um the benzene ring okay and this produces nitrobenzene 
So let's have a look. You'll notice, guess what? You'll probably be able to run through the reaction in your head. It's just the same. So you've got your benzene ring there. You've got your NO2 plus. That's your electrophile, okay? Electron loving species. So have a think. What do you think is going to happen first? Okay, well, the electrons from the benzene ring are going to go for that NO2 plus, and you're going to form an intermediate. Look, it's literally, you may as well just be the same. We form this positively charged intermediate. Remember, these lines here can't extend beyond these carbons there. Okay, so then what do you think will happen? So there's your intermediate. What do you think will happen there? Right, the electrons from there go into that positive charge and reform that electron ring. You see, it's, it's just the same. And then we form our product, our nitrobenzene. There it is. Now, remember what I said about that HSO4 minus. Well, now you've got this H plus, um, HSO4 minus. This now reacts with the HSO4 minus ions that, were, that are floating around. Um, and what that means is we can deduce that H2SO4 is obviously reformed again as a result, but that means that sulfuric acid is actually acting as a catalyst in this reaction because it is reformed at the end. So if they ask about the role of sulfuric acid in the nitration of benzene, then you can say it's a catalyst, and we know it's a catalyst because the hydrogen that was on the benzene ring before the substitution is used to make the sulfuric acid back again. So that's the H2SO4. Now you've got to be careful because you've got to keep this under control. So a temperature below 55 degrees will ensure a single uh, a single nitration substitution. Anything above this and you're going to end up something where you've got multiple substitutions here. So it must be kept below 55 degrees if you just want one nit um, um, NO2 group on here. That's quite important because um, particularly, I mean, you would never do this in school obviously or college. If you had a methyl group attached to that, so just one methyl group attached to that benzene, that would be called uh, methyl benzene, or it's also known as toluene. Now, you would never, you're not allowed to do this for obvious reasons. You're not allowed to nitrate toluene um, in a lab um, because if you nitrate it once, that's fine. But if you get it above 55, what happens is you get multiple nitration and you end up with something that is, well, that's TNT. So, and you don't want to be making TNT in the lab because it'll, um, well, obvious reasons i'm not going to it um right okay so that there are your four main reactions okay to do with um the reactions of um these electrophiles with benzene and um, there is another type of reaction that you need to be aware of and this is the sulfonation of benzene uh, and basically the the reaction conditions are very similar we're just going to use concentrated sulfuric acid we're going to react that directly with benzene under reflux and we're going to do it for a couple of hours um or a few hours it might take longer than a couple of hours or we can actually um, uh, react benzene at 40 degrees, so this is at a much lower temperature, with fuming sulfuric acid for 30 minutes, and we make benzulfonic acid, okay? So it's about knowing the different conditions that you can do it with, okay? So let's have a look and see how this works. So sulfur trioxide, that's SO3, is the electrophile and is formed from some form sulfuric acid so sulfuric acid is h2so4 and it breaks down or decomposes to form sulfur trioxide and water now if you did it the other way around obviously that's how you'd make sulfuric acid anyway so you'd make sulfuric acid by um forming um by using sulfur trioxide and bubbling it through water and you form your acid so the reaction mechanism is exactly the same or very similar to the nitration reaction okay the mechanism for this so you can see that there's a lot of similarity here. So using fuming sulfuric acid is a lot quicker um, and requires a much lower temperature as higher as there's a higher concentration of SO3 molecules. So this method here, the second method of making it, um, is obviously a lower temperature. It's much quicker because fuming sulfuric acid has a higher concentration of this, which is what you need for this reaction, rather than using concentrated sulfuric acid under reflux, which takes a lot longer. So let's have a look at this reaction here. There's our benzene ring, and we have SO3, sulfur trioxide here. So that's what sulfur trioxide looks like. Delta positive carbon, we've got three electronegative elements surrounding that sulfur in the middle there. Now, that is quite powerful. It's powerful enough for benzene to react. So the electrons from that lone, from the electron, the electrons in the delocalized ring go in and attack that delta positive sulfur. And so have a guess, think what might happen next. Honestly, this is just, it's very similar, isn't it? It's literally just carbon copy, just different chemicals. Yeah, 
Okay, so this is the only bit that kind of changes a little bit here, where we've got the breaking of the um, the double bond here. So we've got a single, uh, we've got a double bond there. So the electrons jump in there, but the intermediate is the same. Look, we've got this positive charge in here. Okay, there's your positive charge, um, and we broke in this delocalized uh, electron ring. We have our hydrogen there. The only difference is obviously this bit. That's the slight difference here. That some of the electrons jump because obviously this is forming a bond there. There's too many bonds around sulfur, so it can only have these six here. So that breaks, and obviously you've got your negative charge and your lone pair of electrons there. Now this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Okay, it's a little bit different to the other ones here. So what's going to happen is the electrons from here. Okay actually jump onto the hydrogen here okay so there's there's just enough space here to allow this to happen okay they're just close enough to do this so the electrons here jump onto this hydrogen okay and then what happens this is effectively forming a bond with that so this must break and re-stabilize that ring just like what you've seen before there we are okay and then finally what we form is this compound here now i've just highlighted the hydrogen just so you can see um, just so you can see what's happening here, but there's no other products produced So this is just sole product that's made here But like I say using a fuming sulfuric acid is going to be quicker and um, because of the high concentration of SO3 molecules Right, okay, so now what we're going to do and um, we've looked at benzene and we know the um, me Mechanisms of the reactions of benzene. There's quite a there's quite a few mechanisms there as I um, as I said um, and also, um, you, we know about the structure of benzene, we know it's quite stable, and we know the reactions that are involved in it. Now, um, this topic is colour by design. So we're going to be looking at how we can create colour from these types of molecules here, these aromatic compounds, okay? And so now what we're going to be looking at are azo dyes, and we're going to be taking this, this will see us through to the end of the video. So azo dyes... Um, are man-made dyes so we're creating so it's color by design we're creating color um, designing new chemicals and new dyes which go onto fabrics that we see that we see around us so azo dyes are man-made they're made from aromatic amines which is what we've seen um, what we've seen before and they contain an azo group because they're azo dyes an azo group is this nitrogen nitrogen link here and we'll see that um, in this molecule here there it is Okay, so there's your azo, um, your azo uh, group there, or your azide link, which links these two together. So this is an example of an azo dye here. You can see we've got some unique features here. You've got your benzene rings there, and this azo group in between. So we link this right in the middle. Okay, so this is an example of an orange colored dye, this one here. Okay. So azo dyes are quite stable molecules because of this benzene delocalized electron ring system. This extends into this azo group. So this is pretty cool. It's a bit like a duvet cover. So you've got a duvet cover here. And what happens is it kind of blends its electrons into this system here. So it extends it out. And this extends it out here. It's like a friendly molecule. So it's merging its electrons, sharing it with this middle group. And that gives it this protection. It's really stable. Now that's good because it means we can use it in fabrics. And it means we can wash fabrics time and time and time again. And yes, okay, it fades and thins eventually. But the dye doesn't completely leach out of the fabric. It holds itself quite well okay um, and even um, in the sun you know if you walk out in the sun on one day you don't want your fabric to decompose or the dye to decompose immediately it still retains its color so these are fairly robust chemicals okay and so like i say they use they're very colorful and they're used in dyes and the reason why they're colorful is light is absorbed by the delocalized electrons okay so these delocalized electrons in here light is um, absorbed by these and this varies depending on what amines and aromatic groups are used to make the dye so you can vary these chemicals here it must have this link here but the types of rings that are attached to it um, is um, is obviously going to change the color of the dye uh, and depending on what groups are attached to here for example you might have groups sticking off these benzene rings here that's going to have an impact on the delocalized structure here which then affects color so we can actually design some of these um, dyes uh, to suit our needs okay so azo dyes are made via something called a coupling reaction and by making um, we make a, diaz a diazonium salt first and then we couple that with a phenol okay after that so the first step so step one like I say is we've got to make the diaz the diazonium salt first okay so this is simply made by reacting nitrous acid 
hydrochloric acid and phenylamine together, okay? But we have to make the nitrous acid first. We have to do like a, a pre-step, so a, a, um, a, a, not a preliminary, like a um, like an initial step, an initial reaction first. So to make our nitrous, um, our nitrous acid, um, nitrous acid is made by reacting sodium nitrate, which is this chemical here, reacting it with hydrochloric acid, and that will form our nitrous acid, which is HNO2, okay? Um, and that forms, uh, and also forms a salt, which is sodium chloride, as we can see, as we can see on the end there, okay? So then once we've done that, um, we can then use it to make our diazonium salt. But just an important thing, I'm just jumping ahead a little bit, that nitrous acid is actually unstable and it needs to be made in situ with the reaction. So it needs to be done all at once. So although I'm separating it out here so you can see the individual reactions, in reality, all of this is done in one beaker. Okay, so it's all done in situ. So first of all, what happens in that beaker is this is made first and then immediately that is then picked up and reacted to form your diazonium salt. So this is what's going to happen. So remember, we need our um, uh, phenylamine first, and this is going to react with your nitrous acid that is just freshly being made. It's going to react with um, HCl, so hydrochloric acid, and we're going to form our diazonium salt, and we're going to form water. So you can see it there. So there's your phenylamine, nitrous acid, hydrochloric acid, all three of these. That's made in situ. We form our... Um, our diazonium salt. We know this is a salt because we've got an ionic part here. We've got negative chlorine and a positive um, azo link here, or part azo link. Um, it will be formed an azo link later. Uh, and then obviously we form water, two lots of H2O as well. Okay. So benzene diazonium chloride is formed, which is this bit here. Okay, that's your salt. Um, but only if reaction conditions are below five degrees. This has got to be kept well below that okay um the phenol is formed if it isn't so instead of forming this we form a phenol remember a phenol has got an oh group on there really important condition it must be below five degrees okay right so once we've made our diazonium salt we then um, um we then need to well what we've done is we need to make the we need to make the um, salt and join it all together. Okay, we need to make our dye. So we add the phenol. Okay, we add phenol to sodium hydroxide and made so and make sodium phenoxide. And then the benzene diazonium chloride is added. What's what we've just made before? Okay, and the reaction vessel must be sat in an ice bath to do this. Okay, so phenol is a coupling agent. Okay, which has a high electron density. Some of the electrons on the oxygen in the OH group actually integrate into the ring. And this makes carbon 2, 4, and 6 susceptible to attack from the weak electrophile. So that's the diazonium ion that we'd seen that we'd seen before. Okay. So the azo dye produced precipitates out quickly and we get an orange precipitate is formed and we formed our dye. Okay. So this shouldn't be, this is step two. This shouldn't be. Um, the diazonium salt this is actually making the dye so that I'll get that changed as well okay so this is what's going to happen so we're going to take that phenol okay remember the phenol group and um, because it's a uh, um, uh, because this actually integrates um, the electrons it pushes uh, well it integrates into the ring it's it's part of that ring then um, there's certain certain carbons on that ring that can actually be attacked that's carbon two four and six so this is a a unique property of this type of group okay so it's a two four six so they're the particular carbons that can be attacked on here but let's see the reaction so there's our phenol there okay so there's our phenol and that's going to react with our salt that we made that was our diazonium salt that we made in the previous step we're going to use sodium hydroxide as well in this reaction. And here we formed our dye. So there's our dye there. So we've got our dye, our azo link, which is in the middle there. That was our phenol that we reacted it with. And effectively the chlorine, just so you can see what's going on here. The chlorine that was there, the chloride ion, is now reacted with the sodium that was formed from the sodium hydroxide. And the OH from here, okay, um, has uh, turned into water made from the hydrogen okay the hydrogen that was on the end here so there would have been a hydrogen there remember this is skeletal forming so you don't see all the hydrogens so there would have been a hydrogen on the end of that hydroxide group and that's fine so remember this is this could this ring here could attach either on carbon number two 
okay, which is there, or it could be carbon number four, which is there, or it could be carbon number six, which is there. Attacking at carbon number four has got a lot more space, as you can see. Okay, so in this case, we reacted at carbon four because this OH group in the phenol, um, this integrates within this benzene ring structure. Remember that, okay? And so this then could attack at either two, four, or six, okay? Which is which is that one there, okay? So just be aware of that. In this case, you you're more likely going to see it attacking at carbon four because you've got a little bit more space. That's going to be quite tight if it bonded there, okay? So that's going to be um, that's going to be the position that we're drawing it in there, okay? So. As long as you're happy with that, you see there's multiple steps there. A lot of marks up for grabs here, a lot of marks. Just be aware of some of these little finer details that go in there about what's been formed, the precipitate, the temperature conditions, the alcohol, the phenol, uh, you know, why does it attack at these particular carbons because of the integration of the electrons within the OH group, okay? And all of this must be kept cool for this reaction to happen, okay? So it must be kept um, in really cold conditions under an ice bath, for example. If you've made this in a lab, you'll see that you'd have to constantly keep this in an ice bath and make sure the temperature is nice and low. Okay. So for a dye to be practical, it must be color fast. Okay, so that means it can't be washed out of fabrics or faded by light. Remember, this is what we we're saying about dyes. They have to be quite stable. You don't want to put your clothes in and for the, all the dye just to wash out and you end up with a plain t-shirt. Uh, and also, you don't want to be walking around and the sunlight's just fading the dye, fading your t-shirt or completely different color. So to do that, the dyes must be some, what we describe as color fast. So dyes have functional groups that allow them to interact with groups on the fibers of your t-shirt, okay? So the more color fast the dye is, the better the bond is with the fiber, okay? So dyes bond better with some fibers than others. So you can see here, there's our fiber molecule and we have loads of OH groups just spinning off from our fiber molecule and there's our dye there, okay? So our dye may have, say, an OH group uh, sorry, there's your, there's your dye there. It may have an OH group that sticks out the side of it on one of them benzene rings. So what we must have, there we are, okay. So amine groups uh, amine groups on the dye can form hydrogen bonds. This must be, sorry, that's supposed to be a nitrogen. I will get all this changed as well. If you do want this, I get all this changed. I put in the wrong, uh, the wrong chemical here, okay. So the amine groups, those should be an NH2, okay. Uh, form hydrogen bonds with the OH groups on the fiber. Okay, so this is these mainly exist on cellulose, uh, on mass and cellulose fibers such as uh, cotton. So you can have cotton T-shirts, for example, or cotton shirts. So um, the dyes you can see will interact with the OH molecules on the uh, on the fiber. Okay, so this is normally found in, like, say, in cellulose. Now the problem with dyes interacting in this way is that the hydrogen bond is not very strong compared with other ways dyes can interact. Okay, as you'll see in the next few slides. So this means they're not very color fast and so the color can bleed in them. So if you look at a pair of jeans, you'll notice that jeans are, um, so you see there, here's a, there's a pair of jeans there. So you can see the jeans are made from cotton, mainly cotton um, and it's denim. And if you buy a pair of jeans, you should not wash your pair of jeans with other clothing if you've washed it for the first time you should always wash jeans separately because if you mix your jeans brand new jeans put them in the wash for the first time with some lighter cloth light colored clothing you'll just damage your other clothing the, the dye will leach out or bleed out of the clothing and will stain everything else and in theory you should be doing that really at least for the first few washes until the dye um, some of the excess dye has been washed out so you've got to be really careful with that so there's some domestic tips there Okay, so, <laughs> but you didn't think you'd be getting washing tips when you're watching this. Um, right, but there are some groups on an azo dye with stronger bonds than um, with certain fibers. So, for example, um, ionic salts such as um, your SO3 minus Na plus, you can get these types of salts as well. So, let's have a look and see how these work. So, there's your fiber molecule and there's your dye. So, this dye has this ionic salt. This could be a dye with an ionic salt on the end there, okay? So, when the dye is added to water, this salt group, like more salts, will dissociate to produce SO3 minus ions, which are on the end here, and you'll also have Na plus ions that are floating around. So, if we add an acid to that solution, then the H plus protonates the NH, um, the NH links, okay, in the fibers, as you can see there. Okay, found in wool and nylon. So these are uh, 
normally it's things like football shirts, for example, um, and, and woolen jumpers. And this forms NH2 plus links, okay, when we acidify this fabric. So this is when we're adding the dye to it. So you can see there, there it is. Okay, so there's your NH2 plus. So this is the after the addition of the acid, the NH goes to an NH2 plus. So this is an example of one of the one of the fibers. Okay, so this is a, a polyamide, as you can see there. Okay, um, and the SO3 minus ion on the dye actually attracts to the NH2 plus. Now this is an ionic attraction. It's much stronger than the hydrogen bonding than we've seen before on the denim clothing. Okay, so um, so this is so it has an uh, an ionic attraction which is not not strange that should be stronger uh, than hydrogen bonds that we've seen earlier okay so another example like you say um uh, sorry not another example so the example that we'd seen before it's the same example um where we have this um ionic interaction here so these can donate protons um to an nh group to form an nh2 plus group as you can see there um, and either an SO3 minus ion or a C double bond O minus, that could be a, um, a carbonyl group as well on the azo dye, um, that can exist. And this is where this ionic interaction is established, just like what we've seen before. Okay, so we can see um, your uh, carbonyl groups um, can also be involved within this type of reaction as well, okay, between the dye and the fabric. Now, certain functional groups can form covalent bonds between the azo dye um, and the OH or NH groups on the fiber. So you can have um, OH groups as well on this fiber. And these are called fiber reactive dyes. These are the most permanent dyes on the market. So if we can form a covalent bond, which is an incredibly strong bond, um, certain groups on the fiber and the dye can form these bonds. They're called fiber reactive dyes, the most powerful dyes that we've got and they really do stick to the fabric strongly and um, and don't basically don't let go for uh, well for a very long time so ideal um, for obviously if we can try and get all dyes to do that and make it permanent then that would be that would be pretty good okay so azo dyes are colorful right and this is down to chromophores okay so we know about the colors and we know um what makes them colorful because it's the the delocalized electrons in your benzene ring and that extends into that azo that azo link as well. So the electrons in the chromophore absorb particular wavelengths of light, and um, those not absorbed is the color that's observed. So remember, if you've seen the um, uh, the uh, uh, metals transition metals um, videos that I've done, so that would be in the uh, DM uh, the DM videos. Um, then you will have seen that transition metals have a color because they absorb a certain frequency of light and all um so when that absorbs that light so if you let me start again so white light is made up of the full spectrum of color so red orange yellow green blue indigo violet so let's assume that um a, a transition metal or a dye absorbs red light okay then the remaining colors so the orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, they merge together to form a different color. And that is the color that we observe. Okay, so that's what we say. So that's exactly the same as transition metals. So a chromophore is generally contains um, features with high electron density. So this could be um, uh, benzene rings. It could be lone pairs of electrons on an atom. It could be double bonds. It could be it could be triple bonds like NN triple bonds. So these are key features. That's what that's what a chromophore is, and it's these which give it this unique color. So all of these features, these can delocalize their electrons into one system in the molecule. Okay, so that's really important. Electrons are not just kind of in one place; they can move around, but the conditions have to be right. So you're looking for these high high areas of electron density. So um. They delocalize the electrons into one system in the molecule, and if the chromophore is adapted, then the frequencies that are absorbed changes, and hence the color changes as well. So this is where we can design dyes to look in a particular way or, or give it a certain color. So examples of how a chromophore can be altered is by adding groups that have nitrogens, oxygens, with a lone pair of electrons. These are a classic example. Um, and by doing that, we actually add these to the benzene ring and we distort 
the ring structure. We distort the arrangement of electrons in there. And if we distort that electron arrangement, we then change the frequency of light that can be absorbed by these. And so therefore, what we observe is going to be different as well. Hence, this name of this topic is color by design. We can alter these or can design these um, dyes to come up with different colors. So let's have a look. So here we've got two different azo dyes. As you can see here, the chromophore is circled in both of them. So that's the that's the ones that circled in, in purple there. Okay. So, but by changing the functional groups, we actually change the colors of the dye. So you can see here, this one is methyl red. There's your chromophore, which are the which is this bit here. Okay. It's where all the electrons are. But what we've done is we've added um, a carboxylate ion see it here at the end here. Um, and then we formed an um, an amine here. So this is a uh, this is your well your um, ammonium salt. This actually it's a t it's a type of salt, but um, no, it's not. It's you only got two. Okay, so this is a this is a tertiary amine. Okay, you got three different groups attached to it. Whereas this one we have a an SO SO three um, H group which is here. Okay, and then we've got exactly the same there. So what we've done is we've changed the carboxylate group. For this SO3H group here. Now that is going to have an impact. This one's got loads of lone pairs as you can see around the oxygens on this molecule. This doesn't have as many. So this is going to have a different effect in terms of the distribution of the electrons in this uh, chromophore here. So for that reason the colour is actually different. This one shows red and this one shows as orange because we've altered the, um, the groups around the chromophore. Okay. There we are. So the lone pairs of electrons and the functional groups are incorporated into that whole chromophore and that then gives them uh, a different colour. So I hope you can see what changes we can make and what of impact that has on the dyes as well. Okay, so for practical reasons, we need dyes to be soluble in water. Okay, that's quite an important point. Because if they're not soluble in water, it's going to be really difficult. I don't know if you've dyed things, if you've dyed um, fabrics before personally in your house. Um, but um, if we're going to be able to use them in dyes or in food stuff, like food colouring, um, then we need to be able to have them soluble in water. And so this one is Allura Red AC. Okay, so Allura Red AC is using a food dye. It has an E number of E129. So if you look in the back of the pack of um, sweets or maybe it's a ready meal and you see the number E129, this is obviously in Europe, it's a European number, so E129, um, then it's vital that this dye um, is soluble in water um, so solubilizing functional groups are added to actually help it okay so this is your this is your food dye there okay so solubilizing functional groups they normally contain sodium sulfate salts as you can see there these dissociate readily anything which is ionic normally ionic compounds like this are generally so not always but generally they are soluble in water so by adding groups like this to either end of the molecule it helps this to dissolve in water so you can see here there in allura red these are your um, groups which are responsible for allowing this to be soluble in water okay so just looking at the color um, the color of dyes obviously we discussed about what makes them colorful and it's about you know what's um it's about the the um, frequency of light that's absorbed and then the resulting um, light that's transmitted back to us uh, which is which isn't absorbed so color is also determined by electron orbitals okay so when atoms form a covalent bond molecular orbitals are created from linked atomic orbitals so remember just before i go forward because this is gonna be a little bit complicated so remember with an atom remember we'll just go all the way back to um, the start of this video and even in year one as well year one chemistry um, remember that atoms have orbitals you have s orbitals you have p orbitals and you might even have d orbitals depending on the element that we're looking at but they have these orbitals okay now when you form a covalent bond these orbitals actually collapse towards each other and they start to overlap and what we form is something called a molecular orbital so by combining atomic orbitals we form new type of orbitals called molecular orbitals and clearly molecular orbitals only exist in molecules so it's when we join the two atoms together and the orbitals overlap to create a bond a covalent bond so 
when we fill up molecular orbitals okay we always fill from the lowest energy first remember if you've seen any of the other videos you'll know that I use the saying that atoms and molecules and electrons are incredibly lazy and they want to be in the lowest energy possible okay and if you have to put them into orbitals they're going to start the lowest energy first okay so um like atoms though these molecular orbitals not all orbitals have electrons occupy them so some of them you'll have some unoccupied molecular orbitals okay so when electrons absorb light okay so when they absorb light energy either visible light or uv can be either of them some of them move from the lowest energy level this is your ground state so you can see here that we've got some these are your molecular orbitals here so you can see we've got some here and some in a higher energy so these electrons for the time being are in the lowest energy because this is the ground state but when we apply a little bit of energy as you can see here we excite some of the electrons in the lower orbitals molecular orbitals and they move into this unoccupied orbital which is up here so one electron jumps up here into this one and we call this an excited state okay don't get this confused with the d orbital splitting that you've seen in the uh, dm topic okay this is not quite the same it's a similar principle because transition metals are colorful so it's a similar principle in terms of you know how we get these colors but this is to do with molecular orbitals rather than atomic orbitals that you would have seen in the dm topic okay so just want to distinguish the subtle difference between the two so in order for this to happen, the energy from the light must equal delta E, okay? So the energy that's coming in must be equal to this energy gap, the value here, okay? Now, if delta E corresponds to the frequency of visible light, then we will see a color, because obviously we can only see things that are within the visible light spectrum, because our eyes are only um, receptive to that. So that's the only bit we can see. If it emits something that's, say, UV, or anything of a higher frequency or indeed a lower frequency like infrared then obviously we can't see we can only see um you know the visible part so the color we observe complements um with the frequency that's been absorbed so remember to see that dm topic there's a bit of a there's a bit of a um a link between this and the the dm topic as i've as i've mentioned before so um basically if we see if this absorbs red light okay then we will observe the combination of all the other colors in white light molded together or blended together and that's the color that we observe that's the complementary color okay so the number of molecular orbitals and the level of delocalization of electrons affects the amount of energy required to excite the electrons okay so that's that delta e that gap there okay so when a single bond is formed we have one orbital from each atom so they are atomic orbitals okay with one electron in each forms two molecular orbitals so these merge together and form two molecular orbitals are formed okay so we're going to use a diagram to help explain this so each molecular orbital can only hold two electrons okay and so there is one filled orbital and one empty orbital so you can see here that we've got our um this is for a single covalent bond so we've got the two just imagine it you've got two atomic orbitals like your p-shaped orbitals okay these rotate so they form a um they merge together and they the result is they form two molecular orbitals okay you'll have they've got one electron in each orbital okay and so they form two molecular orbitals but one is filled and one is empty okay but each one of these molecular orbitals here can hold two electrons each but remember when we form this bond we form this from two electrons individually okay so them two electrons from the original atomic orbitals sit in this molecular orbital at the bottom so there is a stark difference between a molecular orbital and atomic orbital just remember that i am using the words a lot and um, it's just to try and make the difference between molecular orbitals that exist in molecules atomic orbitals listed exist in uh, atoms and molecular orbitals are formed by joining atomic orbitals together in a bond okay i hope that makes it clear because this is really hard it's tough this okay so the energy gap between these orbitals is large and a high frequency of uv radiation is required to excite the electrons so we need a really high frequency here because the gap is massive in these single covalent bonds 
okay so remember in a chromophore what we're looking for is really anything where we've got a delocalized electron system a double or a triple bond okay for us to see that so let's move on to a double bond so when a double bond is formed we have two orbitals from each atom and that forms four molecular orbitals because it's a double bond okay so we've got two orbitals from each atom they form four molecular orbitals so it looks something like this there we are so you can see we have two filled molecular orbitals which are here and two empty molecular orbitals we can see now we've got four and the gap is much smaller between the um filled molecular and the the filled empty molecular orbital okay so the energy gap is lower and so this means the frequency of uv and um, so therefore a lower frequency of uv is required to excite the electrons okay so remember uv on the spectrum if you do physics you'll know about the electromagnetic spectrum so uv has got a higher frequency than um, visible light okay and we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at the the spectrum as well um in the next slide we're going to show you the, the spectrum and see where that fits in but we don't need a higher frequency of uv light to excite them electrons okay in a double bond right so moving on to a different type of bond so these are delocalized systems so remember when we have them single bonds either side of these and these overlap to form this large kind of ring structure here so these have loads of orbitals overlapping okay there's loads of orbitals here overlapping um, and so therefore the energy levels are even closer than what we'd seen in the single and the double bonds and because they're closer um, then less energy is required to excite the electrons in the molecular orbitals that are occupied to the unoccupied ones and this means that a lower frequency of uv and visible light so now this is in a territory that we can see is required okay because we've got this delocalized system within our benzene ring and so we also get delocalization in molecules where there is an alternating, alter, alternating double bonds and we call this conjugation okay so this is getting very kind of uh, technical now isn't it so um hexa 135 triene for example so if you look at this big molecule here you see you've got alternating double bonds the electrons in this double bond can then move and merge right across this molecule here um, and because we've got loads of different capabilities of orbital overlap we then have loads of molecular orbitals created which have small gaps between them and because they have small gaps between them it means a lower frequency of light is required uh, a lower frequency of light can be absorbed and that means we can then see it visibly see the color of these chemicals so in summary the more delocalization of electrons the closer their molecular orbitals are and the lower the frequency absorbed and hence we can see colors we can only see within the visible spectrum with our eyes remember okay and different functional groups delocalize differently into that chromophore and um and so we see different colors okay so just as a kind of reminder um just to show you where that fits in so this is the only bit that we can see that's the one that's visible to our eyes so if you've got a lot of overlap um loads of molecular orbitals formed therefore you've got lower gaps between them so therefore we can see a lower frequency that's the lowest frequency which is radio waves and the highest frequency is gamma rays so we're looking at this spectrum here so single bonds absorb ultraviolet so we can't see what's reflected from these with single bonds double bonds is kind of in the same area as well so again it's difficult to see or visibly see things with double bonds in in, in the chromophore but as soon as you go into <coughs> excuse me as soon as you go into triple bonds and delocalized ring systems like this we get a lot of overlap forming these molecular orbitals and it starts to then encroach into the visible light bit which means we can see the colors of these okay so that's just where it fits in in perspective in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum and that is it <laughs> okay so there's a lot in that one isn't it right so that's everything you need to know for benzene mechanisms the dyes and color for the um, cd topic like i say this is one of three videos that make up the color by design topic the cd topic um there's a full range of these videos um on for year two and year one chemistry they're all specifically designed for salters so if you are studying salters i know there's not a massive amount out there but these videos are perfect for you because they have everything that you need for salters um you can also there's also some whiteboard videos as well in there they're all for free please just subscribe that'll be absolutely fantastic you get all the updates and i'll keep on updating them um if people keep uh, subscribing and watching um 
Also, if you want a copy of these, great for your revision notes, print them out, put them in your file. I'll get all the little bits on here sorted. I'll get them all uploaded. Then click on the link below. You'll be able to get a hold of them there. Great value for money. Um, and you can use them on your smartphone or your tablet or anything like that. Uh, right, okay. I think I'm going to go and have a lie down. <laughs> that was a big, big, big video, that one. Right, okay, that's it. Bye-bye.